to introduce our speaker today, um, Fawo Fani, the Rachel Fani Broom. Um, Fani is the first Samoa woman to qualify as a yacht master. Study sailing at the age of six. Fanny has been passionate about traditional voyaging and navigation. She's a Commonwealth Award appointee and was listed in the BBC's Top 100 Inspiring and Influential Women in 2018 and is an advocate for youth development in focusing on programs that align with culture, traditional navigation, um, wise ocean stewardship, and also equality of gender. So welcome, Fanny. Um, we're looking forward to your sharing today. Thank you. Thank you for your patience with the little techno gadgets here. Um, ooh, okay. Afifio alo o pesta to ya ana tama langi. Ifalefa o sao. Leainga sa pesta. Lefalefa o sa maunga. Malefale lua ya sa fune. Pa ia ainga sa so alo. Lefalefaya ya inga. Malamalu yao to sa maunga. Faftai, faftai tele mo lava noa. Talofa, lao ho. Is that right? Mm -hmm. In, I would like to thank you all for sharing your time with me today. Thank you. I'm from the villages of Sa Maunga and the Fongoli, Savai. It's the large island in the South Pacific, in Samoa, in the South Pacific. My mother's people are fishermen. My father's people are, some would say, plunderers, conquerors, but they were basically sailors from the Nordic, Nordic region. My name is Felfani. I live in a small little island in the South Pacific. This Pacific Ocean that I live in is the largest in the world. Every second breath that we breathe is actually from the Pacific Ocean. Think about it. It does a lot of changes to how daunting you are in this, in this world, in this Pacific. I won't be talking about traditional navigation in the Western sense. Um, I'll be very candid throughout the whole presentation. I'll be sharing my experiences and what little knowledge that I know about indigenous navigation from the Pacific. Um, this art form, this knowledge, is also called wayfinding in certain parts of the Pacific. When we voyage, and I mean voyage anywhere, not just in canoes, but in our minds, new doors of knowledge will open. And that's why this voyage is all about taking on the challenge to learn. If we inspire even one of our children to do the same, we've succeeded. Words by Nainoa Thompson, one of the renowned wayfinding experts in the world. Him, along together with a few other Pacific Islanders from the Pacific, from Hawaii, from the Cook Islands, from Aotearoa, have created this art wayfinding and have brought this renaissance of traditional navigation in the Pacific back. He said these challenges were challenging words while navigating one of the most difficult difficult routes from Mangare, Mangareva, Tahiti to Rapa Nui, Easter Island. <coughs> in Samoa where I'm from, traditional navigation, I'll be using this word traditional navigation because that's the concept but it's indigenous navigation. It's a, no, it's a lost art form where I'm from. It's, it's something that we have challenges in reviving. The, the canoe is not strong in our, the canoe culture is not strong in Samoa. It's not as strong as, a, um, as it is in Hawaii, in Tahiti, in Micronesia. It's something because where we think about, we speak our language every day. How we dress, how we sing, at, uh, how we sing 
how our mannerisms, when we walk in front of somebody, we say, excuse me, is it too low? How we respect our elders, how we respect the next person, that's our culture. So we find it going back to the canoe, not, it's something of the past. So in order to, um, to revive this culture is, is a challenge mentally with our people because looking at the canoe is something of the past. Um, our ancestors navigated this vast space of ocean. It wasn't just a lucky hit. They repeatedly returned to these islands. Of all the voyaging societies in the Pacific, the most challenging one in, with, that we have is the Samoa Voyaging Society. Um, this voyaging society is the caretaker for this canoe that um, I captained for the last four years. Um, sorry, there you go. Um, before I continue, I'd like to do a little ad lib in saying, you may not get what I'm saying right now, it's okay. I'm still, or understand what I'm trying to explain as well. I'm not as eloquent as some academics. I'm not as eloquent as some non-academics either. So bear with me. I'm still learning in the ways of traditional navigation of wayfinding myself. So there will be a lot of questions, I'm sure. Um, what I'm learning is a modernized way of wayfinding. This is something what Nainoa Thompson, um, Bertie, Uncle Shorty all came up with. In Micronesia, traditional navigators learn the knowledge of navigating from when they're babies, literally. A newborn is placed in the water. Not even, uh, that's, that's how they bless their children. They place them in the water. This baptism of sorts is a way of opening paths for this child. Uh, this, it's their connection. It's feeling the currents of life. I started wayfinding literally seven years ago and I'm 30 plus years old. So I'm still, I'm late in the game, let's say. When I started down this path of navigation, we were first taught that when you talk about it, it's not about learning the exact rise and set of the stars and the moon and the sun or calculating how fast our drift is or even knowing the ocean currents during those certain times of the years and the patterns of the weather and such. It's about watching. It's about understanding. It's about awareness of nature, of your environment. We were taught the history of why the, na the stars are named such. There's a story behind each star, why our ancestors called it, called Scorpio, um, Timatawa Maui, Maui's hook. The start of a voyage in the Pacific sense is starting when the first spark of the idea we should voyage comes. That's how we start a voyage. A voyage doesn't start from, from uh, when the canoe or when the vessel leaves the island or leaves that, that land. The start of the voyage is when we're going to go on a voyage. We're going to talk about it as a family. We're going to talk about it as a village. We're going to talk about it as an island. This, this island then will go into the forest and start talking about it. Asking the trees, asking um, the resources that are there, would you be so kind? We're going to change your, your space. Um, we're going to put you in a different space. We're going to shape you in a, way, in a way where this space will help you and you will help us. It's a lot with the whole evolving of the, the trees, the environment, as well as the people themselves. Then there's talk, then it goes on such where they'll start planting the, the food crops the, for the voyage. They'll start um, weaving the sinnet. They'll start um, prepping the crew. They'll start, um, it goes on and on. It doesn't start from when 
the vessel leaves. It starts from when the mentality thought is we're going to voyage. Before going on a voyage nowadays, with this, with the experience that I've been taught, you have to study up, you have to research, you have to st declination, um, weather patterns, ocean currents, types of birds you'll be seeing, current, certain regions, certain times of the year, certain um, everything that will affect you, everything that will affect you. Um, with this day and age, it's so helpful to have um, to have these resources ready at hand, like the internet. Um, you can go on and ask those people in, in England, oh, can, can I get a, a pilot chart for this region, please, right? Um, it, whereas you have to, back then in the days, it was something where you had to study two years, just sit there and gaze, see how it is, understand the weather patterns during that time of the season. Nowadays, it just takes about 10 minutes to download one of those um, weather charts, those pilot charts. It, it takes a, it, our, 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 our jump now in, in how it is with modernizing it, you adapt to the change which is now. And um, I'm so thankful that we have insurance and life jackets nowadays in comparison to how my ancestors probably came and had a, like some, a coconut sinnet woven around their, their leg and that was their, their insurance. Um, it helps a lot when you're in weathers where it, you see 30 meter swells and, and it's blowing 50 knots and you're thinking, why am I doing this again? With, on this voyage that you're, you're compiling together, um, you're thinking about going out on. The whole concept is, you see the island, you make, you don't, um, you see the island, it's a clear picture of this island that you know that you need to go to. Now, you don't go to the island in itself. The island comes to you. You've already seen the island. You just need to get there. That's the clear point. That's how you, that's how you navigate. That's how, um, it, when you're on the water, you already know the island is there. You're just bringing it forth. That's it. It may seem a little bit, huh? What? Doesn't make sense there. But that's literally how it is. You already know it. You can do this. You got this. It's there. Um, my first test together with the crew of um, sailing tradition with, uh, we call it old school on our canoe, um, was 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 challenging. We did it from Altidore to to um, were to the Tuamotu Islands in Tahiti. Uh, it's about some almost three thousand miles. Okay, it's about two thousand seven hundred and something miles. Um, we had to do it uh, half half old school, traditional way, as well as using the um, the charts. That's how we we were. Um, we were, they, they helped us along. They, our captain was a bit lenient. Um, we traveled, we voyaged together with six other canoes and um, the best way was keeping together, staying together. But at a certain waypoint that we set out on, we're like, okay, it's tried nav all the way. Um, this was our first test to see if we could actually do this. So from Altero to the Tuamotus, um, we started off with just the charts and everything else we used. We, um, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, the currents, uh, what fish we, we fished during that, that time of, of the year. Uh, we landed. We sighted land. We passed that test. It was, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty good to feel that we were able to accomplish that. And that's not even, that's like maybe hair, a splinter of a hair of what our ancestors were, were able to accomplish. I'm going to talk a little bit about houses, swells, and direction. There's a, there's a traditional, there's a traditional star compass that Nainoa Thompson had created. 
this um, it's very basic it's so basic that it's simple in, in navigation and it's so it's I wonder if I got it no I don't in a house think of a, a, a circle you have a circle a house every area angle of the degree this house is about 13.11 some uh, degrees each house is 13.11 degrees yeah so with this house you think of the canoe inside this circle you have a set of stars that come up during this time of, during um, during this time of the year the canoe is in is more or less the needle in the circle okay so the group of stars we call them baskets so they come out at a certain time so let's say for example um, from 6 p.m. to 9 um, p.m. you have a certain set of stars that rise up from the northern quadrant you divide your circle into four quadrants with how it is northwest northeast northwest southeast and so on yeah during the setting of the during six o'clock you see stars rising and you see stars setting your first basket of stars start rising those are the stars they start looking at because you know you'll own you'll need those stars set of stars for three hours what stars you do see setting you know you'll probably see them for only two hours or an hour so you use those as well they will set on the western quarter as it is you use the, the stars that rise or the basket of stars you'll use a series of stars of um, constellations because not all stars literally um, go down very nicely like you want them to do like I had the challenge you know, so why are they doing that but no you have a whole group of misaligned I like to say that misaligned uh, constellations though they'll, they'll be setting like this which is at the end of the day I understood oh that's so beautiful now I can un now I know this whole group set of stars are there to help me find find my way by using the star compasses to help you navigate birds swell movement rising and setting of stars in the direction of the wind all stars and moon which rise in a certain house and quadrant will set in the same opposite quadrant so um, the other tool why you have there is not just only the canoe which will help you you also have your can collaboration you measure the span of your hand and whatever notches that you see I have a lot of lot of ones there are two ways of doing this during sunrise you stand at the far end of your canoe with a compass or with the with the knowledge that you know that the sun sets or sun rises at this certain time at this certain degree of the quadrant and you use that as soon as the sun starts setting or rising from your hand position how you measure it off from the edge of the canoe choose whichever part of the canoe that you know that is close to where the sun is going to set and that's what you use you mark your hand to set your bearing so whatever you measure off on the canoe is what you use as bearing for when the sun sets my one house is actually now because I stretch my hands a lot you have to constantly change your 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 collaboration of your hand constantly have to search for it uh, not change it it constantly changes because you're constantly using it um, I think I've collaborated my hand about three four times already it goes you stretch really hard you point your hand out don't know if you guys seen that Disney movie Moana it's similar to that but not really like that yeah uh, but um, yeah um, the other way of measuring is you have a gauge pole you literally have a gauge pole in the backyard and you measure your, your gauge pole like a sundial of sorts yeah you measure and you set which one is your bearing um, finding latitude and longitude in the northern hemisphere you have Akupa, which is the northern star Polaris it's such an amazing thing I wish we had that here 
but we have a certain set of stars that you can measure off from the South Pole um, for, for that. But nothing compares to Polaris. When you're at the equator, the horizon is parallel to the Earth's axis. And so Polaris looks like it's just on the Earth ocean surface. It's, it's amazing what you see out there. If Polaris were to ri rise one degree above the, ocean, the horizon, this means your position of latitudes, latitude is one degree north. You know you're with longitude, you know your, your, your course is made good, and you calculate that by your speed and your drift. The evolution of traditional navigation today is not the exact method of how our ancestors did it. What we do today is an evolving method of grids and charts. What makes this similar is, as mentioned before, was nature. When you're in that zone, you feel constantly anticipating every move. And that's what you have to do. Um, you're constantly on the watch. You don't sleep. I think there was one time I didn't sleep for four days straight. You have, uh, it, there was this voyage uh, we did to Hawaii. Um, we left the Tuamotu Islands for Hawaii together with this fleet of s six other canoes. Um, it was one of the most challenging ones ever because we literally had to do it old school. This time without the charts. This time without paper. Without a calculator. <laughs> um, not even a pen. We had to do everything up here. We had to remember everything up here. Add... Side note, I kind of cheated along the way. My cheat method... What were the oranges that I ate along the way? <laughs> I had a way where I just had a peel. I tried it with a banana peel, but I found out about three days later it was disintegrating and it kept on going blue, um, bruised up, right? So I used it with a peel. I marked the peel every single time I had to think in nines, in six, in tens, how much we're going up. That was my cheat factor. But um, it was one of the most challenging things I've ever done. I'm so thankful I didn't do it alone had two other watch captains with us and the the arguments that went through that we had who was right who was wrong uh, who had overestimated who had underestimated we had watches running um, three hours on six hours off with teams of three so each of us was in charge of a team each of us was in charge of making sure that our course was right our canoe literally had um, no traditional navigators on board. Uh, we had very n little um, training done with by the other traditional navigators um, in comparison to the other canoes. They helped greatly, although there were, because tight was just time was so tight, we didn't have that much time um, allocated for us to train. So there were it's a time when we were sailing from, we were voyaging from, um, from Aotearoa to, to the Tuamotus. They placed a navigator, a PO, a PO navigator on board. Um, this is a NAS master navigator. And he was with us for five days, and that was our um, test run with him. Uh, from the Tuamotu Islands to, to Hawaii, we made landfall first, we sighted land first, and it was a successful navigation uh, out of the other six canoes. And everybody was safe, and along the way, the crew, lit the crew were extremely aware of what it takes to, to, to navigate this way. We were extremely in awe with how our, na our ancestors had it even more challenging than we had, right? Um, I end this with saying thank you very much to the Parasite Gallery. Uh, I have 
there's so much shells encompassing just like the voyage it takes uh, when you start a voyage there's different branches there's a lot to talk about there's a lot to share um there's a lot in exchange um but uh i am one of those people that need prompts unfortunately um so if anybody has any questions feel free to ask it's challenging right on um thank you very much everybody for making your time uh yeah was that the group of boats Yes. So this is in Itatucky. This is on our way back from um, this voyage that we did. It was from the Tomotus to Hawaii and then Hawaii to California, along the coast of Mexico, through Galapagos, um, and then to the Cook Islands, to Samoa, and onwards to Solomon Islands. And luckily we didn't do that um, under Tradnav, but we did do Tradnav from Mexico all the way down to the Galapagos. That is one of the most challenging things ever. Um, on a personal note, my dad did from the somewhere in Mexico to Marquesas halfway. Their their GPS or whatever they were using broke, and so they appointed self appoint. They appointed him to be their navigator with a sextant, and they landed not in Marquesas. Um, they landed in, um, sorry, it was actually from Galapagos to Marquesas. They did not land in Nukuhiva, but they landed on one of the other islands. But he, his, his, the share, the shared thoughts of what he said, he was like constant pressure because there was a whole bunch of other people who knew much more than he did. The only reason why was because he was a mathematician on board. So they think, oh, Jan would do it. His, his. It's practical. He he will make it easier, but yeah, um, it was challenging to have. Um, you have a crew of sixteen people. You have those sixteen people over your head. Then you times that by six other canoes, and then you need to make sure that you're all voyaging together to make sure that um, we all keep in a fifty mile radius kind of thing to make sure it's safe, because that's how, what it's all about. When you go out, and and when our ancestors landed, it was about all thanking, um, thanking each other, thanking what gods they 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 thanked back then in making things safe that they landed safely, and the Pacific is heavily populated today, so they landed safely, and then there's the thought of those who didn't. That's a large amount. What sailcloth did you use? Was it similar to the bark outside, or did no? Um, for these modern times, we use uh, the canoe is made out of um, a glass, and the superstructure on board on top is aquila. The masts and the booms are made out of pine organ. The sail cloth is what you would get at any sail maker, um, and what did the they engines. Use in the past, uh, in the engines, uh, sorry, in the in the past from what we've read and from what stories we say there are, are um, phrases there are verbs in in in, in Samoan where we say um, when you pass a certain island in Samoa take down your la fala and put up your la afa which means though the the, the items the exhibition you saw outside, that's what we used. The pandanid leaves were woven as, um, uh, were used for sails. Um, and then take down your la fala, which is what that is called, the item, it's um, pandanid leaves, and put up your la fala, uh, your la afa. Afa is coconut sinnet. So they also use coconut sinnet to weave the, the sails with. It's something which is used in life. If you find that um, something is challenging, don't hit your head against it constantly. Make it work for you. Um, embrace it in that sense. So we don't say difficulty, we say challenge. Um, can I ask you the trip that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. How long was it? It was pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> um, days. Yeah, um, days. It took us about... Um, 19 days circa.
from the Tuamotus to Hawaii, that trip, yes? Yeah. The full voyage took us two years. The full voyage did two, yes. was two years from Aotearoa. Um, actually, we started, we started in Samoa, we sailed down. Um, from Samoa down to Aotearoa, met with the rest of the other fleet, and then continued back and then tracked north. It took us two years. So, what did, so the food is you stopped and refueled and stuff? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Every island that we came onto, um, that was uh, provisioning there. Um, okay. A lot of the provisioning we did was accordingly to um, using the absolute necessity. Run out of meat, run out of meat, tough luck, start fishing. And that, and that, was, that was the, under, and the, the whole point. You because, do it. yeah, uh, that was the whole point. It was all about wide, um, wise stewardship along the way. Well, your ancestors would have done it if they had gone on a long voyage. Oh, yes, they did very well, I reckon. Um, in certain parts of the, the, the Pacific, they still practice the art of, I guess, here in mainland China, it's fermenting. In, um, in the Pacific, it's a type of fermenting, whereas um, they pound taro together. They pound cooked taro. They pound it until it's actually something very not so tasty now, <laughs> nowadays. A little bit chilly, maybe it would be okay. But um, it's, it's uh, well, there's an English word for it, but I can't remember the, the texture. It's so sticky, it's so gooey, um, and they pound it together, uh, and they keep it in bamboo sticks. Um, and that's your and it's fermented. Carpet. And that's staple, um, yeah, that's a staple diet. Um, in some parts of the Pacific, we dry fish. And, um, and that's just one example of the, 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 the staple diets that, um, that we came across. In Samoa, where I'm from, we still practice uh, in some parts of the island, but it's done during ceremonial purposes. In uh, breadfruit, I don't know if, yeah. if I'm familiar. Yeah, starchy. Yeah, yeah, starchy food. Very so <laughs> breadfruit, um, we ferment it. We literally dig a dig a hole, mm -hmm. pack the whole hole. Maybe something pretty big, because it's not just for you; it's for the whole village. Mm -hmm. You, the whole mentality in Samoa is communal. Mm -hmm. um, pack it down, pack at the bottom with breadfruit, not cooked, mm -hmm. just breadfruit, mm -hmm. and then leave it there, um, cover it up with leaves uh, all the way up, leave it there for a month or three weeks, come back, and it's it's oh, hard as, as cabin biscuits, and it's n apparently uh, nice. I've tried it once, and that was the last time I ever wanted to try that again, <laughs> but it's, pr it, it's practical. It was something practical. So um, I have a, an observation uh, and a question at the end of it. Um, so being from Fiji, what, what I did as friends of the people that were part of the Fiji Community Society um, was judge the whole project because the project was born in the German man's mind over there in Europe and they built all the seven canoes and then they gifted the seven canoes to the seven countries. And what I thought was that in Fiji we remember building canoes that knowledge still exists, or why couldn't we just build a Fijian one? And then so, um, it's easy for me to do this kind of thing because I'm an activist, um, but the thing that I found after was the joy and the ideas of cultural reconnection that was born on the voyage was so incredible. And what I wanted to ask you was to talk about that with the seven voyages, the, the seven canoes sailing in one direction at one time, and that idea of uh, community and connection, and also as a group of people, with 15 people per canoe and seven canoes moving in the same direction, that must be incredible to be part of that relearning. And I'd like you to talk to us about that experience. That, that must be incredible. <laughs> I, I can only say for mine, um, of course, uh, it was, let's just say it was just one island. It was one island moving. We're about, we had two support vessels with us. Um, in case of an emergency evac, we didn't have the luxury of calling um, for emer an emergency evac. And um, this very generous man, Pullman, Dita Pullman, um, had this vision. Uh, this started in 2008, I believe, the story goes. And 
the Cook Islands had a traditional canoe. These canoes are 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 a merge of of, of, of different designs from 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 the Eastern Pacific. And then they created that. Um, he saw this canoe that was from there. The person who designed the, the canoe is actually um, a Cook Islander, Tom Davis. He's, he's apparently a former NASA um, designer, yeah, from NASA. Um, this very well, awesome man, Papa, Papa Tom, designed this canoe 25 meters longer than this one. Bigger, she's a beast if you see her. Her name, um, this canoe is based in Aitutaki, the Cook Islands. This was my catalyst of, of when I first saw this canoe. I was just like, whoa, our ancestors was crazy. <laughs> the bare elements burning up and down like that. I mean, I understand it wasn't just, it, w it was similar to this, but um, in the halls, we have the luxury of, you know, changing watch, being a little bit dry when you're underneath, but our ancestors didn't, you know, they were open to the elements. Um, I saw this canoe, this canoe was a catalyst. Um, this canoe came to American Samoa for the Pacific Arts Festival. Um, this Pacific Arts Festival is a huge thing where all like minds come together and share and exchange. Um, Dita Pullman came to this Pacific Festival, saw the canoe, saw the different societies, saw people who had like minds of regarding um, revival of the canoe culture in the Pacific, how it is, how it was with um, the Hawaiians, how they revived it 30, 30, 35 years ago now, and they're, they're full speed ahead, they're way ahead of the game. Um, he saw this. P went to the meeting with the with the whole, with the other like minds of um, people who were thinking about building a canoe, another canoe. He goes, why build one canoe? Make a mold, build more than one. Have each con island, um, give each island their uh, a responsibility, because that's what it is. Give the end the choice to have one. So, two years and a half. 2008, the the vision that he that he he saw, together with um, these like mind peoples, um, it was done in two two years. Seven canoes later. Those two years after that, you constantly had to train, had to train people, had to actually um, had to say all these things, right? And it was it was it was challenging. Uh, it was fun. It was challenging. Um, you build that relationship during training with other people. When we did our test run voyage, which was in 2010, we voyaged from Aotearoa to the Cook Islands to Tonga and then back to Aotearoa. This was a test run for going all the way to the Americas and see if it is actually possible with these canoes to go through that small short distance to this longer distance through these um, and how will mentally the crew be able to cope? Dynamics on a canoe on a small little island like that is challenging and beautiful as well in itself. It makes you understand the real person. Um, yeah. It, what language did you speak among yourselves? We spoke, our canoe has, each canoe has certain protocols. Mm -hmm. We, we, um, there's, 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 there's this thing where bringing the canoes back, because this is how we, 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 we came upon these islands, um, and then our customs and our culture and our talks and our beliefs change from being on the canoe to, to, to being on land. So our customs, we brought them from the canoe to the land, and now we have to take them back now onto the canoe. So, um, Somebody like me, I'm not as uh, well efficient in uh, my mother's language nor my father's, um, but we speak Samoan on board. You're not allowed to speak English, you're not allowed to speak Chinese, you're not allowed to speak Pidgin. It has to be straight fluent Samoan. Um, it's one of the many protocols that you, um, that you direct.
like for example when I first started I did a protocol entering this space and this space on 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 this island before I was able to start and that's the same deal when you come into a, a, a new area and not only that but you're you're sharing this area with other people and these people are are inviting you to share it with with you you have to start protocols in that sense so there was a lot of exchange of the culture people come from different backgrounds but during the training years months actually it was just months um, the different different people different cultures this different cu customs but when you're together and you you have a common uh, passion those barriers go down for example just now I just met Peter and started talking to him like I know him already I just met him two seconds and I'm all like ew 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 <laughs> like it, it all these all this all these lines that you see on the maps on the charts um, breaking up these uh, certain parts of the world or even in the Pacific Melanesian, Polynesian, Micronesian, those are just lines. You don't see those lines when you're out on the water. You don't see those lines between us. They're just lines that are placed there, but they're not really there. Right? So you um, learn and you also have this awareness. Mala, mala, ma. It's, uh, it's like some people use that as understanding, but um, in this context, it's awareness. It's an epiphany, yeah. Does that make sense? Is there any difficulties about being a woman? Uh, what's the term? No, no, no. <laughs> and that's not the term. What's, what's, what's the what's the actual? Uh, singer. Uh, mm, I. Um. So, in the protocols, you have your navigator, you have your captain, and you have your cook. You find out who's most, the most important. <laughs> no, uh, traditionally, it, the, it's the navigator who is the most important on board. Um, the navigator are your eyes. The, the captain is there for your safety. The cook is there for your soul, your passion, yeah, spiritually. I mean, it helped me a lot <laughs> to be making best friends with the cook. <laughs> but um, it, it was challenging training the crew. I came on board uh, on and started off uh, training a lot of the crew. We had our captain was um, was French. He was a cool guy, super cool. But had no, unfortunately, he had some weaknesses in the sense of not being able to, um, uh, he was able to get along with everybody. He was everybody's best friend, let's say it like that. Yeah? And you can't be captain and you can't be best friends at the same time. That's, that's when they don't start listening. That's when your crew don't start listening to you. Alright. Um, my crew who I to um, train, my, the first group, they're young boys, 20, 20-ish. 20 I was only four years older than them, six years old, four or six years old. Older than them. And then we had an another set, the second group who came in, and they were guys who were from, who are older than I am. I have a crew member now who's 73 years old. He's the most awesome fella ever. Oh, darn. It's a, but at the same time, I, 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 this, 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 this elder, our Komatua on board, his, 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 the pastor, his, if you're not a, if you're not Christian, then his, your soul searcher for you, you know, um, and his also our elder on board. Of course, there are times where I have to put him on his spot and it's unfortunate. Because I grew up this, with this fella. He, he started sailing, literally, um, uh, competitive sailing, since he was 16 years old. Okay? 
and um, I've known him since I was a baby. And then having it on reverse where his teaching, or I'm teaching him, showing him and, and sharing with him, it's, and, uh, it's very, very challenging at times. You have a group of, not, in, not just men, you have also a group of young girls who can be challenging as well in, in sharing what, what knowledge I have in training them. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's a beautiful way to learn how to be patient. <laughs> it is. I'm serious. You don't know how much patience you have until you actually, wow, that could have gone wrong very easily. Yay. You know, it's just, it's, yeah. What kind of traces do you keep? Are there songs or poets, poems or um, of the canoe? words, which can be fast or? A, um, we do, okay, how do I, okay, because we're still trying to revive our culture, we have to look to uh, not just, we have only what's been said in books, in history books, or from school when we're taught that our people are, came from Southeast Asia and that's it. There's nothing else. So we have to look into our own songs, our own um, idioms that we have our own paraphrases, um, proverbs that we have in, 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 in acknowledging that, okay, this actually came from one culture of the canoe onto the island, and now we have to place that culture back on the canoe. So a lot of, um, if you see a traditional voyaging, ah, here's a perfect one. The canoe, the superstructure on top, uh, let's see if there's like one very easy the wooden beam everything on top no nails it's all lashed on okay so the lashing of the canoe is how we lash our houses as well so it's 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 in everything that we do um yeah does that make sense our songs, our, our, our literacy mm. is not kept mm. on pieces of paper, mm. on stone. Mm. Our, our literacy is kept in our songs, in, in, our, in, our, in our, how our orators talk during a ceremony, um, and how we dress, and how we dance. That's how we keep, that's how our, our, our literacy in, our, in, in the Pacific is, in, in, in Samoa. So as you are saying, when when you arrive to this island, you change. I forgot what you said. In your words, uh, you change sailing systems, for example. Yes. So is one. But then, are you creating new one as you continue? That's that's one of the greatest things that will let because you're on something modernized. You're practicing practicing a, a, a navigation that has been modernized. I would. I would think you would adapt as well to what you would be saying as well because that's the whole point mm -hmm. is um, constantly adapting to change you don't want to go against it be, and if you keep reviving something old it will headbutt with something new so um, a lot of the a lot of the culture beliefs that we go through uh, for example in 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 Hawaii, they do this thing where when you arrive to an island or you arrive to a new space, you, you lay a stone on this piece of space. And that stone is, it's the same with um, in, in Maori culture and in, in East Pacific culture. You have that, you have that piece of stone. That stone is mana, that stone is soul from the last previous place that you brought it. Before you take that stone away, you have to ask if you can um, remove that, that stone from its space there and place it in a new space. Um, in Samoa, we don't practice it at all. But it's something new that we've been brought in and we practice it. In Tapu Tapu Atea Tahiti, 
you would see how many stones, a whole, maybe something, half a football field of, of stones, literally, of marais. They're called, um, they're platforms, they're marais, they're terraces, yeah? They're liter littered all over the Eastern Pacific. Um, they're, they're pretty huge boulders. Then you think about, whoa, those legends may actually not be legends at all, but actual stories, how big the people were and how many people came on these canoes, over 200, so our stories say. Because the size of those stones that was exchanged and placed as a terrace, you think like, oh my gosh, that's humongous. You were talking about stones to, as large as this room, 10 meters and bigger, yeah? Choose up. You can Google it. <laughs> it's called Tapu Tapu Atea, Tahiti. Uh, it's on the island of Raiatea. Um, you think about that. And then nowadays, what we do is we take a small little stone. <laughs> because that's, that's a lot of weight on a, on a canoe. That's a lot of weight putting, you know, if you're, uh, yeah. I don't allow weight that is heavier than a battery on board. I, accordingly to how, uh, what your ballast is or how you're going to balance out your, your canoe, your vessel is, is, go is very, very challenging, especially when your canoe is already heavy with people, with food. Yeah. So is there a written system for some other language? A written system? Yeah. Yes. Uh, in, in Samoa, we, we study Pacific studies, we study Samoan studies, um, and yeah, in, in schools, you start it off from homes, families, and from first grade. So Is that what you mean? Alphabet, A, B, C? Yeah. You write in alphabet. Okay. Yeah. We write in Latin, yeah. Okay. And it's very similar to pronunciation in Latin, A, E, I, O, U. Okay. To how, yeah. Can I ask a boring session? Go for it. Uh, noticing one of your early photographs. Yes. That is a brutal steering system. It so how is. Do you, so how, do you, how do you train these young kids to steer? Because it, it, losing control of a steering oar like that, anybody who's steered a dragon boat here in yes. Hong Kong knows, because it's exactly the same system, yes. knows how incredibly easy it is just to lose control and the boat takes charge. So that's your biggest challenge on a long voyage, since it must fatigue the helmsman quite quickly if they're new at the game. Yes. Good question. Um, technically, it's pretty long. I don't know. How do you, how do you go back? Sorry, Anki? It was about, it was about three meters. Like yeah, it yeah. is. It's yeah. circa about three meters. Sorry, how do you go back? Right? Sorry, no, it's um, it's longer than uh, not three meters. About it's six meters. Six. Yeah, six meters. Uh, I always go okay. back and this is... Yeah, and you had a spare, I noticed. So yes. Long, so, rigging. there you go. So, you see on that far one, you see the... Um, the foy, yeah. The, the first one you had actually had it had it perfect. All right, on. Okay. That there we go. Uh, there so it's about six that, that meters thing, long. Yeah. yeah. So it is challenging, and then you see the spare here. Yeah. The spare is about seven meters plus, and it's heavier, and the fin is wider. Yeah. Okay. So when the canoes came out and they had that because Teotonga, the first mother canoe, had that. She had that. This is the large vessel in um, in the Cook Islands. Now, and it was all replica after um, over Teotoma. This is pretty long. We found out during training our training um, trials that uh, why don't we make a smaller con um, foy paddle, I guess, um, steering paddle, something that is lighter smaller, shorter, and the fin is a little bit s small as well, and it's designed in a way, as you can see, this is like straight, and this one is curved. Give it a little bit of curve because it is challenging. We use, and so the the boatyard came back, we gave them a design of how we'd like it, and the, the, the boatyard came back with something smaller, easier, simpler, much more to maneuver. Um, this on a challenging day, I would never use this at all because it's so challenging. I used to be um, the smallest and the most weakest on board, um, and all the all my crew are tall, you know, big set guys and everything. So, and they were they were they were able to handle the foy. 
Um, how we handle it is with a line. Instead of you know, with, a, with a rudder extension, we use a line. So you just have a line from this end going straight to the foil, wrap it around twice, and you move it with the line. I have this system where I introduce and share with a lot of the smaller crew members, um, female or male. Um, what you do is you set your sails perfect and you fine tune your sails. You have to set them constant, constant, and constant. This is what I'm so thankful with my first captain, um, Mark. And his a uh, his a uh, speed bunny. His um, and he helped us, trained us in the sense of setting sails properly, and that helped us. So I have the crew constantly adjusting, adjusting, adjusting to their their fine. Even you know you're constantly trimming, just like on a Hobie hat, you're constantly trimming. With this, you're constantly trimming as well. Maybe not. It doesn't move as quickly as a Hobie cat, but it does move straight away. And I bounce the canoe. I bounce the foil down, bring it out of the water. There's no weather helm. The canoe has two um, center boards, so the center board is, is always on the windward side. Yeah, um, that's constantly adjusted as well, according to what your what your in terms of sail are, yeah, and you just play literally with the sails more more than. So, so in effect, to put it semi technically, what you're trying to do is not have to steer because it's such a brutal system that if if you only need it for minor adjustment, ultimately you're steering with the sails and the centerboard to balance up the hull and the rig, so that the boat is effectively self-steering. It is self-steering to a certain point. Because it's so, he it, 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 it's, yes, it, it, to a certain point, you'll be like constantly, um, you bounce the, con you can um, do that during long voyages, depending on the wind's perfect, the wind's perfect, you set your sails, you tie your foil down so there's, it's out of the water, and you're set for your watch, right? I'd like mm -hmm. coffee, please, right? Um, other times when you need to steer, you need to steer. And... When you have, sometimes when you're, you're on a watch of three hours or if you're on a watch of four hours, you have a team of five. So that makes it very simple. I mean, that makes it very a little bit easier than it is. You're only on the floor for 40 to 45 minutes, yeah? And it's up to your watch captain to divide it up even more. Either you go on to the foy um, about two times, three times, it's up to him. But at the same time, I have this thing personally where I have the person on the foil for a certain amount of time twice just so there's no fatigue but at the same time understands not to um, drift uh, because um, our navigator is a taskmaster like if you're off by literally half a degree um, um, uh, an actual compass degree a western compass degree he'll be like right on literally next to the person on the foil chastising him and that's and that's that's a loose face. Do you keep a logbook? Yes, we do. Um, like said, more than more, more than times, um, you have to have a logbook. Yeah. What language does it carry? Uh, numerals. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's in English and in Samoan. Okay. A lot yeah. of our crew um, uh, are uh, their their first language. Samoan first language is Samoan. So it's literally um, when we go old school, the, the, the official logbook is in both languages, English and Samoan, because the system, the government system uh, accepts that. Um, but when we have, when we navigate old school, it's, it's done by only the captain. So he, whoever the captain is, if, if he is, uh, only knows one language, it'll be kept in that language. Um, how would you describe your relationship with water? Whoa, challenging. <laughs> <laughs> with the ocean, she's as fierce as your mother, and as gentle as kind as can be. <laughs> yeah, yes, because you know in Pacific um, culture, we were just talking about that um, earlier today. Um, 
you know who's going to have your back and you know who's disciplining you afterwards. If you get in trouble, it's your mother. All right, she's going to discipline you and it's not with a nap. Nah, it's with a shoe at the head or, or, or something even worse. Um, unfortunately, that may be a little bit like harsh to some ears, but that's, that's how um, Pacific Island um, ugh, mothering is. Um, yeah, she's, she's fierce, she's beautiful, she's everything. She's so gentle and she gives. She gives so much and it's only right to give back. Seki, 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 um, in, in Samoan it means, in English, roughly, set. I'm going to teach you a little bit of my culture as well. Um, it means set. Um, eh. The canoe itself, you see the solar, solar panels. She's 100% fossil fuel free. The engines we have run off the solar power. Okay, um, air, uh, wind, and everything else. When we voyage, uh, the provisioning is literally no. Uh, when when I skip her, no cans allowed. Um, because if we're going to Tonga, it's a three day sail. If we're going to Fiji, uh, we've done it in less than three days, but um, with good winds but it's up to five to seven days if you're going against the wind to the cook island it's two weeks two weeks to ten days yeah and no cans allowed how we provision is literally a lot of root crops taro potatoes um uh, manioka uh cassava um a lot of the perishables go first and then all the pumpkin, all the food that won't last for months, the cabbage, or we had cabbage from Aotearoa all the way up to Hawaii. I could not believe that. That was like three months later. I was just like, whoa, gosh, these guys, you know? But it's how you pack it, you pack them. And it's how you, um, it's how you pack them and you store them. That's basically it. So we take only what we can well, we know that this voyage is going to take three days, but I'm going to take two days more, so five days of food, um, in case we have, you know, and we, we got, and it's provisioning according to the average islander, and uh, yeah, um, and meat, meat, very minimal wheat, meat, um, uh, maybe maybe two days worth of meat that's it i will take if we're doing a week voyage even around the island that's a week voyage because i'd like to have the crew to like stop around and you know take in the things um so the practices that we practice on the canoe is what we also practice on on land um the workshops we have which are grassroots workshops with the different schools the different villages uh there is a there's a there's a smaller island than Samoa. Whoa. It's about only about maybe 10 square meters. Miles, sorry. There are three villages on this. Two primary schools. I think... Mm, this one, there. Two primary schools. That one and that one. Um, and they have aluminum vessels. It's 30 minutes from the main island. It's called Monono. And this island... This island is pretty pretty cool in the sense of they do the same thing. They um, we go to these places and they we we showcase what we do. Um, there's only uh, and we share what we we we, we talk about um, about uh, ocean conservation, coastal um, conservation as well, and inland. It's not just 
the ocean, but it's also everything that affects you. Um, not a lot of people live on the ocean <laughs> like we do. Um, most of them are on land, of course. And it's all about um, what they, what this island does, they also share with us. Um, really small things. Um, they don't have water, they have tanks. So they conserve their water. We practice the same setup. We don't have a desalinator on board. We carry um, jerry cans of 30 liters. That's it. 30 liters is not much. What water, fresh water we use is just drinking and food. If you want a shower, big ocean, use a shower there. Bucket, over. Use the bathroom, bucket, flush, gone. Don't think about it anymore, right? Um, and you come on board as a new greenie and I have crew members who come from the plantation and we had to practice um, uh, or, or train them how to conserve water. Not a lot of people would get, understand that because Samoa is lush. It is blooming. We have waterfalls everywhere. I live next to a river and, and it's always going. Yeah. So not a lot of people have that concept um, of switching off the pipe, the, the tap, when even though there's a drip. Yeah. So, so this island is a very beautiful concept where they actually conserve water to, to a sense. Um, the, 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 the programs we come in and talk about is something a lot of these islands are already practicing. Um, but at the same time, what we do is, uh, is initiate different ways of practicing it, as well as giving them the, the platform to, in raising that. Um, say for example, there's a place in, um, on the mainline Upolu, they don't fish a certain spot for one for 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 a certain time they go after this season they will change over that gives time for this area to actually grow back up um, to populate again with fish and then next season they'll go here gives it this time when they come back rotate back to this place the fish are at that size where you're allowed to actually fish for right um, the the cleanups are and the tree planting are the most basic fundamental ones but it gives, um, it gives people, it, give, it gave me, I guess, I am better using it, it gave me a good feeling of actually doing something that dirties my hands and, and then actually I can, um, this tree, I'm going to plant it here, um, plant 10 trees today. When I come back or when I have kids, my kids are going to see these 10 trees. You know, it's something as in that sense of giving the, the village a sense of pride, the district, something as in sense of um, they, they're, they're, they're generating um, good, there's that word again, stewardship with people, with, with the, not just the ocean, but the environment itself that they're in. There's a whole lot of other stuff, but I'm feeling tongue-tied at the moment. Um, the kids, oh man, when they come on board, the, some are very, very, that island, the kids there were awesome. They wanted to go, um, sheet in, they wanted to, uh, touch the foil, they wanted to go uli the foil themselves, um, steer the, steer the canoe. They were, I had to, as in sense, do a little pedagogue right there and, and then show them because you don't want to, um, you don't want to distance them. You don't want to give them that, 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 no, you're not allowed to touch. No, don't touch. You might hurt yourself. Um, be careful. No, it's more or less taking them in hand, showing them, th um, this is the best way to do it. If you want to like, you know, stand, you stand this way and it's, um, and then you have kids from the inner, 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 inner inlands because, um, even though the canoe needs a place to come in and park during the villages that we do go into, um, we invite 
we come to a district and we hit the district. Districts are consists of 12 villages and it starts from the coast and it goes all the way inland. So we give each village in this district a day and we just do or two days. Um, so three villages knocked out in two or three days. Yes, it's very, it, it's very full, hard, full on, but at the same time, it, it's awesome giving them that. Um, the hesitation from the kids from a, li a little bit inland because they they get a little bit wobbly. They they walk um, t holding on to the rails or to the lines, and they don't want to touch or a little bit. But then next minute you see them coming coming by the canoe because we're there for a week, and they come by and they they come by the second day, and they they're actually really doing they're getting a little bit comfortable. They start washing dishes for us or, you know, we get them integrated in the activity that is the everyday housekeeping or the everyday the what we do. They come early in the morning, the third day, the you're like next minute, don't you kids have any homes? Don't you need to go home? You know, do some chores at home. They they gradually make, you know, get comfortable with the environment that they're in. Uh, on the same <laughs> I think it's a cool movie. It's really awesome. Um, but I think maybe sometimes people will get caught off with the, 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 the that it's a Disney film because Disney does that a lot where it's just a oh it's Disney. But the message that it brings, um, if people actually look into it a little bit more, because I don't think it's just a it's just a movie for kids. It's a movie for adults as well. Um, this mate of mine, he's 45 years old. He was like, let's go watch Moana. And I was like, no, I don't want to watch Moana. Oh, he's all like, let's go. So Moana premiered in Samoa and um, our whole crew went together. And it was a mixture of kids and everything. And I finally understood that. Yeah, man, this is cool. Just sat in and just watched and I was like, whoa, whoa. Just, it was, it was, it was amazing to hear your own your own songs, your own chants, um, some motifs that you see on the big screen. It, it's something tangible, you know? It's pretty cool. And yes, I think it is pretty good um, uh, in set up with Moana. Um, yeah, especially with girls, huh? <laughs> Oh, go somewhere warm. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't know it was 18 degrees here. <laughs> oh, it was my fault not doing the research. Um, should, should have come last weekend. Oh, gosh. Um, What's the oh, beautiful 30 degrees. <laughs> it's very humid there. Um, we're in our wet season now, so it's humid. Um, in the shade, it's maybe 28, you know, a cool breeze of 28. Um, otherwise, it's 30 to 33 degrees. Um, what am I doing after this? I'm going back to school, actually. Um, uh, it's very challenging sharing this with a group of rooms of <laughs> people. <laughs> but I'm going back to school. Um, and my seven-year plan is to start up a boat, um, boat yard in Samoa in building canoes for this is the part I'm going to edit out because <laughs> it's still in the works um, in uh, set up a boat yard in Samoa we do not have a boat yard in Samoa that builds canoes and something where it doesn't cost 1.3 million but something that costs a lot less and um, uh, for everyday use and encourage safety at sea in Samoa, the, a large percent of islanders, and even especially in, in, in Samoa, don't know how to swim. You live in an island and you don't know how to swim. So it's one of those um, institutes, those centers, those um, spaces that I like to create and build on with um, uh, the backing of, a, of this village that I'm from in, in Savai, where we create a center of safety at sea. Uh, the, the the Maritime Institute in Samoa does do that, but they do it at certain levels of 
for example, it's at university level. That's it. So um, if you want to learn how to swim, you go to a private club and that's it and you pay this much. Where this institute will be for everybody. Where will you go to school? Um, in England. Hopefully, um, I've already applied. Hopefully when I get there, they will be open. But um, I'm going back to Samoa at the moment after this and get pack up, get everything sussed out, and then at the end of the year, yeah. So what will you be studying? Marine engineering. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It'll be challenging, because I hate yeah. math. <laughs> <laughs> I suck at calculus. <laughs> but I understood vectors, so it shouldn't be that bad. <laughs> How long is that course? It's about two years. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. I might like die after the first first semester. Yeah, okay, thank you. you. <laughs> I know. I know. I need to get an electric blanket that's, or something. That's a hot summer's day. Oh. <laughs> Funny because uh, like two days ago before Peter arrives, um, I sent uh, our previous uh, residency artist, uh, 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 artist in residency, and he's from uh, Russia. He's like, oh, I'm going to leave this warm place and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, uh, my question uh, is, um, like, because I think including me, many of the uh, audience here today are maybe not sailors or who have not had this experience before. Do you have any uh, suggestions, like, or recommendations to make us feel this is still something that is accessible to everybody, or would you recommend we like try um, this experience? Most definite. Majority of the voyaging societies, which have with um, their organizations, trust institutes that um, that the the canoes. Besides these canoes, there are other canoes that um, that have been built. This is just one project. There are multiple other ones, but um, the voyaging societies are very open. As you can see, how do I go back? We have. Those of my two crew members from previous times, um, visits, uh, we have literally, these are, this is the Tongan, we were in Tonga, they have a Tonga Voyaging Society, and we do, um, and, but Tonga unfortunately does not have a canoe, they're, um, they're fundraising for one at the moment, um, because Samoa is very close, we do exchanges, program exchanges with Tonga. Um, educational wise, um, clean um, cleanups, uh, and um, every and this is American Samoa up there. We went and um, we carved literally had a had a went um, uh, cut down the, the the trees in Samoa. Did the program exchange in American Samoa? Carved them up, brought them over on the ferry, carved them up in. Um, in American Samoa, with the help of the kids, it's the whole you know understanding, um, being comfortable with the water as well. What they have in American Samoa is they have a program for every summer for young kids and being comfortable with the water. And it starts with paddling, um, stand up paddling. Starts with um, uh, canoeing um, on the V6, the the outrigger canoes, um, as well as swimming. So that was something we're introducing that exchange program with the American Samoa and the kids literally did that though though and these are the traditional canoes um, that is still built in in Samoa at the moment and we use that for fishing long line fishing you just go out drop a um, drop drop a lure overboard and then just play with it and if you're lucky you get an albacore or a shark <laughs> but yeah um, sorry. And it's open up to a lot. There's a lot of exchanges with all the different voyaging societies. Um, they're very open to different people as well. It has no, there are no barriers at all. Um, you come, there is a canoe in, um, in Aotearoa based in Auckland at the Maritime Museum in Auckland. They have three canoes based there. Two are constantly voyaging around North Island, but and one is based there. They're called Hongui, um, and 
Aotearoa one is in um, Hinamuana. So they take out charters and you just, and if you would like to train, you rock up there and you put in some elbow grease and a lot of enthusiasm in the sense that you'd like to um, do a week with them or a day or it's all volunteer work. Everything, I've been volunteering for, for these, these canoe projects, this canoe project since 2010. So it's been very, very liberating. It's been it's such an awesome learning experience. Like I said, pa pa patience, a lot of that. Didn't know I had that, but now I know I had that, and um, a lot of self development and as well. Um, the the Hawaiian Voyaging Society in Hawaii. Um, there are so many canoes there, um, double hull canoes, different designed from these. Um, Aotearoa has three other canoes as well besides the three at Maritime Museum, different designed as well. Uh, in Maca in uh, Micronesia, they have this sustainable sea transport um, uh, fleet of canoes. I think it's three of them as well, three or four of them. And this is one of the, the relief, not relief efforts, but one of the ways to make um, make it out of it I don't know if you you would know but out in the in in far scattered islands like this it costs an arm and a leg to go on a ferry fr from the mainland to um, the main island to to another island to your to your own island which is probably like maybe less than 500 miles away it it doesn't cost like or or less than 200 miles away it it's ridiculous. A lot of people in Vanuatu have to um, pay, have to earn, save up the whole year just to go back to their other island when they when they come to school or they come into work on the main island. So this sea sustainable um, transport project that they've created, Okeanos, that's the hub that has created these canoes, they made it a little bit more easier for people, not only to transport themselves but cargo as well. Um, in Fiji, the Voyaging Society there has created something where they help out with relief efforts during a cyclone. Um, and they've also done something with monitoring um, efforts, not just the uh, monitoring of the fish, the coral, in the outer outer islands, not just in the main island. Um, it's one of the many things that's pretty awesome about these canoes. They, they open up to anybody. So I wouldn't hesitate, no matter what your passion is. Canoes from the different islands in Micronesia or wherever, in the Pacific, they have similarities? No, no. Very different. Mm. Very different from each other. Okay. Um, the, even the sails are set up different. Oh. Uh, um, the this is the top this is very how these two masts it's very um very modern it's very western the two masts mm. how they're set up mm. you would usually just have one short mast even of this size and then you would have a lot a large sail and that's it um on a on a canoe uh, so what what stories we tell what's been said as stories as well as what the old pictures tell us during and this is pictures that during even Captain Cook times um, and to even way back um, farther than that uh, according to some of the, the documentaries that have been um, uh, sorry the documents that have been um, dug up as well um, so this is very different like I said it's a modern design canoe um, some are not don't even have double hulls. It's just one outrigger. So and and which is just an outrigger is a long piece of stick. <laughs> Let's just call it that, right? And just as big as that um, that that plastic bubble wrap thing. And you just have uh, another um, hollow canoe on the side, and you have that long one out, and then that's it. And you would maybe have a spurt sail, a shunting setup system, where you just move, where the canoe is like this, double prow, 
and you just move the the sail from one end to the next, which means you don't have to turn the canoe around. You mm. just change this this end to this end. This will now be your end when you change the the sail. And how a lot you, of that. How many people do you have on each watch? Five. Five ish. Five. Yeah. If you these canoe are five, um, five, five, fifteen. And Bunk captain's out of the watch. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't stand watch, do you? No, no I just stay awake in, in all place, the time. Yeah. That yeah. Thing in the middle, yeah. yeah. Yes. So <laughs> that thing in the middle is uh, the fale. Um, in the front, we have the fale paku, um, which is the bathroom, the toilet, the long drop. And then, because we have these modern times considered with new mar maritime laws with um, keeping the ocean clean we have a holding tank with another toilet in one of the halls at the end. So when we're out on the ocean, we use the long drop, and when we're in the lagoon, close to the coast, then we use the holding tank. Uh -huh. And the hulls themselves, can you the, sleep people in the hulls? Or? Each hull is bunked for eight people. And the bunks are this tiny, this, this wide, and a, a little bit longer than I am. Uh, so... And, there, and then at the bottom, you have your storage space, and your storage space is this small, <laughs> literally. So your bag better be packed accordingly to your storage space. You're not allowed to get any more. Um, there will be, the only storage space allowed on board is water. Yeah, there you go. That's it. You just learn how to You pack your bag. Um, sometimes a lot of the, the crew will just come in with extra bags or something. And I was just like, yeah, you can put it on the gangway. You can just step right over your own. That's fine. But it's not going under where it's easy accessible. Um, just make it as, as long as it's out of the way and it's neat, tidy, that's fine. Um, but it goes through whoever's captaining first to check that it's not, it, it's fine. Like you have proper, you don't have any dangerous goods or whatever on board. Because we have protocols for that as well. So, you know, I find it very interesting that, um, uh, like, all these islands in my country, Pacific, mm -hmm. they must have been, and the people must have been Austronesian at some point, mm -hmm. long time ago. And the Austronesians were very good mariners. And uh, so, um, do you have traditional Samoan stories about? Yes, uh, most of our so our songs yeah. about are about voyaging. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them are about some form of voyage. Uh -huh. um, here's another thing where I say our literacy is not in um, is not written in rock. Uh -huh. um, it's not written on the top of cloth. It's not written on fine mats. Uh -huh. But in a sense, it is written on the fine mats because it's woven. And that's and the whole process of making a fine mat, of making tapa, is 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 our literacy, is our is our work, um, our work, our how we do it. Because there's a process, there's a protocol, and during everything that we do, we make even from from stripping the the tree off from its bark, we have to ask, and the asking is a chant, a song, a dance, or however we do it. Um, so, ah, okay. Our tattoos. Samoa is one of the. I have the tattoos. Mm. Uh, Samoa is one of the places where we have tattoos. Mm. Um, I don't know, but a lot of people say that it, it, it's a lot of works say that um, the word tattoo came from the Samoan word tatau, and it just came became tattoo and said tatau. Yeah. So, men. The traditional tattoos, mm -hmm. men, they're from here to here. Mm -hmm. All of this mm -hmm. is considered land. Everything about land, everything about how, um, about land itself. You have motifs of the canoe, which is land. You have motifs of birds, uh, uh, not sorry, not just birds, but mountains. Different types of motifs along this side. Uh, this is a mixture of Tongan and as well as um, Samoan motifs there along the side. Textiles outside have some of 
Mm. Okay. So um, with the female tattoos, mm -hmm. it's from here mm -hmm. to here. And these motifs um, occur to a lot of people, a lot of the documents being presented nowadays by um, academics from the Pacific point of view, uh, these motifs are actually all about how to get to land. And this is called the Malu. Malu means in Samoan sacred protection. A lot of people were thinking because of Malu, in, um, it's called Malu and you have your genealogy as well on it. But this is also considered something, something one of a kind where you don't always use it for common common use you use it according to to when it comes out um, so the malus are malus are usually something that looks like this yeah and you have the star chart you have star patterns and you have the angle of degrees in the back here you have your um, your genealogy of your family um, with the men it's very bold it's very dark you have land patterns you have cloud patterns you have something of the land you have um, the, their canoe is tattooed on the back and you have um, animals uh, cat um, the centipede you have um, different types of um, everything that, that 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 is land so we say the women um, protected the genealogy and the tattoos are to show you to the land, whereas the men kept the value of the land. And that's it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Do you use your tattoo to navigate the... Oh, no, not now. <laughs> because <laughs> this is all different. I don't... Um, there's... there's there, <laughs> you see, you see right. different females. <laughs> different fem um, different tattoos. <coughs> Nobody has the same tattoo. Right. Nobody. Um, and the, when you talk and you create the rapport with the tattoo artist, Tufungo, Tufungo Tata, you create that rapport and you start talking about your genealogy, where you're from, um, your, who your family is, right? And then he has that pic, he has that picture, that idea. Um, and then from his knowledge of what he has studied, and um, th that's when he starts drawing it out. So uh, it's an identity marker. It is. Very yeah. individual, because each yeah. person is different. Yes. I, in in itself, though we say these are star charts, whereas and as well as ge the genealogy of your family. So we, anyone can see these tattoos and, and know, oh, this means this, this is no, this is you. No, no, um, oh. not everybody can can do that. Nobody can um, actually not. Uh, sorry, not nobody. Um, let me correct that. Um, not a lot of people can un identify the tattoo motifs nowadays. There's oh, a difference you between. You have to be quite learned in these things. Then you have can. learned in in the yes in someone culture. Mm -hmm. um, an orator would know, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who has who practices the art of um, tattoo would yes. know uh, the different uh, the different places of of Samoa. Would it would it previously have been? more like a set of village ones, which was this particular group had their sets of tattoos, which they would know. The story so, so goes that um, the tattoos were gifted from these two females to wherever they went through Samoa, they gifted them, the, the families that. So in Samoa, the places that they went to are different villages in different districts. So, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Thank you so much. All good. You mentioned sailing against the wind up to the Cook Islands, which is navigationally much the most challenging thing that anybody's going to do with a, a non-instrument That's tradition. when you know you have to be on point with your longitude. <laughs> right, but presumably you do it on time, if you're going to have to tack. Oh, you you need to know how, how long you're going to be on this tack, that tack right. at a certain time, how much drift you're going to take, 
Well, what um, what the waves are doing, what the current is doing that during that time of the year as well. It constantly right. changes. You just need to be on point about it. Right. Or, or, or else you think you're going to to the Cook Islands, but you end up in New Way, which is literally 600 me- miles south of Samoa, straight south, and you're going the wrong way. How do you the tides if you can only use the, the almanac or any So, like technically, the tides are closer to land, right. and whereas currents yeah. are out in the ocean. Right. Um, you, like I said, it's so beautiful that I live, uh, we live in this modern day and age where you have certain pilot charts available now and they tell you and you just uh and you just need to remember you have your notes of course right and, and to study, study up before yeah. you actually take that step on that voyage but all your notes are taken away from you your notebook is taken away from you everything everything's done by 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 remembering well presumably that's what the young kids would have learned in navigation school, as it were, as they were growing up, the older chaps would have told them, and gradually they'd have built up the knowledge of the current patterns and the seasons of the year. It is. Nowadays, in Micronesia, it's, they practice traditional navigation, indigenous tr- navigation. These are families, these are fishermen, these are people who don't probably, uh, don't have time to write these constant things. There's no such thing. I think... It's so brilliant. I mean, this is how almost everybody, it's somewhere buried in the Museum of History here, I know, and I've never found it yet, there is the last sung navigation guide from uh, Shandong, up mm-hmm. the coast, mm-hmm. as far as Macau, Ahmed. And That's this old awesome. fellow learned it, began learning it when he was seven, and he'd mastered it by the time he was 12, and he sang the route from Shando to Amen. That's awesome. It, it was wonderful. Wow. And That's awesome. It, there's a recording of it, and it's lost somewhere in the History Museum. That's it awesome. Was made in the 70s. He's dead now, 30 wow. years. Um, that is awesome. That that's it's it's so it's so cool to know that there's so much out there mm. that that is similar to what you and you're not alone because mm. at times. You have these thoughts when you're out, when you're on the water, you see nothing for, for literally two weeks, you see nothing. You see nothing for 16 days, and you're just staring out there no, in this no, vast no, open no, space. No, you've betrayed yourself. You've of course, water. you've seen a huge amount. No, you've let, seen let me, let me of get waves, this. You see, you see nothing <laughs> because you have, you have that hesitation. And we're taught not to have that hesitation. Mm. We're taught at the at, during training time, you hesitate, you close your eyes, you're lost, and and that's one of the things. But you can't help but being human and have those hesitations, and you're you're staring out there and you see nothing that you think, and you start second guessing yourself because it comes. You start second guessing yourself. Shoot, May, I should have seen that island now. I should have seen that um set of um, instead of uh, the refraction of the waves, I should have seen it now. Why am I not seeing it now? Third day, it should be now. It should be from that ve- that direction. It's not there. So, so what I said in one of my emails, I think we are all trapped in a concept of precision that we ought to know. This is measurable. Whereas I don't think our forefathers were like that. Uh, they got out there, and when they arrived, they arrived, mm-hmm. and they they would know that because they'd see it. And if they didn't see it, they wouldn't arrive, and we don't know about those guys. We have no idea of the percentage loss rate of early voyages. It could have been very high. We don't know of that at all, and that's why I made mention of it. Mm. You see the island's been populated, and we're fully populated. And then there's that point where, what about those who didn't make it? Mm. Uh, we don't know that as well. We don't know how many waves came through the Pacific. Um, now, so far, we say there's five waves that went through the Pacific. But through those waves of, um, of voyages that came through that were gapped up of, you know, by thousands of years, we don't, we don't know about those who actually left because we don't have that in our stories. We, have, um, we don't have that percentage, that number, that exact number of at it all, at all. Can only no. Take the messages from the people who exactly. left them. Yeah, 
And what's then that's about it. Well, we have something ancient like that in, in Hong Kong, you know. I mean, like um, in Wong Chopang, in um, Shek O, there are some uh, carvings on quite high cliffs mm. and rocks and all that. Um, and at fresh water sources, and they look very much a bit like Maori type hieroglyphs and stuff. And it's been dated to the Bronze Age, which is about 3,000 oh. years ago. But we do not know what it means. And um, it is um, supposed that these are very seafaring people along the coast, you know. Really? And of course, they would want to mark where the fresh water source was. And they would also, um, they had maybe some thing to the gods or something like that, because, you know, they. They did these huge hieroglyphs very high on a cliff. How on earth did they do it 3,000 years ago? Um, yeah, and it, and it's very much like all those patterns on the like Maori cloth or something like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe these were ancestors, you know, who were exploring um, all these oceans all around the place. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Um, shall we just take one more question? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that would be pretty cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, um, a little bit with what you mentioned, um, and what you mentioned as well, with the, um, you said most of, not the surface part of this island is new, 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 new land, yeah. like it's been placed on. How much of it? And then that's and how much has that you know throughout the years has the the change of this coastline? This harbor, yeah. This harbor is only fifty percent of the size that it was Which in eighteen forty one. Oh, oh sick! Yeah. Wow. Where the maritime museum yeah. is, uh, the mm -hmm. distance to the nearest land on the other side mm -hmm. is seven hundred eighty five meters. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a little boy here in the late forties, mm. it was two kilometers. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So uh, through throughout the, and in that sense, along the along the years, so much has changed mm -hmm. with the landscape as well as so much of the, the change of, you know, we have this saying. Um, there's a song, this chant in Samoan. Mm -hmm. the, um, there are two women who brought the tattoo, the art of tattoo, to Samoa. And they 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 swam. That's what the, the chant is called. That they swam. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people say um, they actually voyaged. They didn't swim. Mm -hmm. So they swam from Fiji to Samoa. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of places in the Pacific called Fiji. So it could be actually oh, okay. a, from a certain Fiji. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily the country Fiji. Mm -hmm. They swam. On their way from there, halfway, they were hungry. So they rested somewhere. And uh, when they started their voyage, they started singing, Tattoo the women, not the men. Tattoo the women, not the men. Along the way, they, they got tired. They went, um, rested at a certain point. Dove under to get some clams. Came back up. Forgot the chant. Tattoo. And then the ch chant changed tattoo the men not the women so and now you see that there's a lot more men who are tattooed than, than the women and it was only through the other songs other chants that women were were there's a like a re renaissance of, of, of women being tattooed now you don't necessarily have to be a certain status to be tattooed because before that's how it was now it's just you earn it by your family saying yes to it. So what age it. would you be tattooed? Uh, that age? Youngest from 15, 16. So a rite of passage after puberty? Uh, I don't know, to be honest, because there's no, there's no talk about that as well. A lot of people say, um, you know, it's when you become a warrior, when you become certain. Mm. But it could also be meaning a lot of things, like a rite of passage of what you actually went through and through your life, or you become a woman, you become a mother, or in that sense, and you get t t tattooed. Your family has bestowed you this responsibility to carry on something, and that's what 
the malu is called for female because you have that responsibility in holding that for the family. Um, so there was a lot of change with that. I mean, then that's, that's basically one of the things. Um, we take that as a proverb with change, with what you're saying with the landscape. Because like, I, thought, I thought Hong Kong was small, but I see everything is built up, and it makes it huge. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I have to look back at Hong Kong Island later today. <laughs> we take the Yes, of course. Which is the most crowded mm-hmm. island on the face of the earth. Which part? Avenger. Avenger. It's the most really populous really island on the face of the earth. Yeah. <laughs> 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 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, what's your... On the ocean? Uh, what, what's her experience of climate change? Oh. Um, out, out on the ocean. Um, that's different from how it is in the um, close, coastal area. Out on the ocean, my experience is, 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 I guess it have to do a lot with the weather patterns. Certain parts of the year, and you're like, hey, what, what's happening here? This, you know, according to the charts, it shouldn't be happening like this. Um, it should not, um, we shouldn't be having this many, we should not be dodging this many squ- um, cyclones, low pressures, yeah? Because there was one time... Um, on a voyage that I just did recently last year from the Cook Islands mm-hmm. to Aotearoa, we dodged about four um, low pressure systems. And that's like, it was constantly being on the foy, being on the, um, the paddle. Um, on, it, was, it, was, it was challenging mm-hmm. mentally wise as well as um, with the weather, but it was awesome. It was amazing. Um, climate change on a coastal factor um, in Tokelau, we voyaged. That was our first open ocean voyage. Ngalofu was invited to go to Tokelau. It's a group of islands north, straight north of Samoa, about three days away. She went there, and um, there was a lot of the first group of islands we came to. There are three huge long groups. It's a chain. This is also the the country in the world, the first country in the world that um, um, is 100% um, solar. Uh, is on solar panels, yeah? The first group of islands we came there, the first group, um, Fakaofo, half of the the main island itself, because it's like kind of like this, so the, the island, it's like a big, huge lagoon, um, half of that, there was a lot of coral bleaching. Um, there, it was, it was, the coral, this is the first time I've ever, there was a lot of talk about it when we were, um, uh, and about what ocean acidification is and yada yada. I didn't really understand that until I actually saw it. And, and when I saw the, the coral bleaching, the red, uh, the redness, the different color, red, pink it was, I was like, hey, is that normal? And then the locals were like, no, it's not. <laughs> and they were just like shaking their head in that sense. Uh, Tokelo is one of the islands in the Pacific where they, you're not allowed to buy fish. You're not allowed to sell fish. If you want fish, go fish yourself. You have to literally. It's to discourage, um, not capitalism, but it's to discourage in the sense of um, greed, in that sense. Yeah. So it's 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 very well it's very well monitored. This this group of um, islands. So that was my first impression of climate change. Um, along the years, we voyaged to different um, countries, Australia, um, for one of the largest uh, UN, IUCN um, parks congress, and it was to talk about um, climate change. Um, uh, we voyaged four canoes going there to talk about the Pacific Islands being the front layer of what's happening. The small group island is going to hit first. Um, is going to be affected when I mean hit. They're going to be affected first. It's not. It's not the huge continent of Australia. It's not the huge continent of the Americas. It's 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 smaller group islands. It's where um, there's there's still a, yeah. It's it was it was it was very challenging, especially in in a country like Australia where funny thing, first port we come to in Southport, we have the 
presentation full on um, in Southport and I was on watch which means I have anchor watch I have to watch the canoe while everybody else go have fun and I have to scrub the deck make sure everything's clean uh, have people come on tour guide and it is such an awesome um, experience because these people came from far away and they made the first step in coming onto the canoe um, the poor thing I don't like about it is because um, at the end I have to clean up after everybody and scrub the deck down at times it's a bit tedious but at times it's okay you get time on your own the first guy who came and approached the canoe during my watch was his question was because he already knew why we were there we have a big banner that says why we're there his first question was do you believe in climate change and I go Mike I voted I left home <laughs> I left home to sail on this canoe no insurance <laughs> to talk about this to represent my, not just my village not just my island but you know the Pacific um, to talk about how it, it how it actually just it impacts not just me at the end of the day it'll impact Australia and he was and you know and he was like okay okay so he came on board had a little talk you know and then he came by the, the very next day and gave us some donuts you know <laughs> it was, it's, it's, it's awesome when you make that click you make that initial you know I could have said I was like oh, you know I, I didn't come here just to um, be to get, get somebody smart mouth me or however you know um, but it was that initial that he actually approached the canoe first he made that initial contact and that meant he was open you know Did and you yes a lot, a lot. Um, we went through the Pacific Gyro um, on our way from Hawaii to um, California, and we we saw it like around I think it was the twenty fifth um, latitude, and that's somewhere smack against um, California. Uh, but we went as far north as thirty seven, and that's Oregon State. But um, we had to do that because of winds. Now on our way of tracking back down, that's when we saw it. Um, the worst was one of the other canoes they took a photo of a whale um it was a sigh whale which had was caught up in nets and you could just see how much in in Cutting yeah there was the deep groove of, of on this picture of the and as well and the fijian canoe uh, another canoe um they came across a turtle caught up in a, in a net so the fellas there because fiji turtles are sacred um, they went over and caught it and then chopped, um, got rid of the plastic that was literally not only caught up, it was caught around it and it was in the mouth. Okay. So I don't know how you know about the mouth, the throat of a turtle is jagged mm -hmm. because a turtle literally just has a beak mm -hmm. and then everything in its mouth from here, that's what the muscles do. It's like kind of like a <laughs> grinder, right? Oh. So Garbage this disgusting. poor thing had this plastic down its throat, you know, and it couldn't literally swallow, eat, or breathe, or oh anything, God. because, so the fellas literally had to pull it out, and, you know, give it a, a good look to make sure that they got everything out from this little jagged, um, and, and let it go. And there was, there was a lot of plastic in the northern um, hemisphere, in the North Pacific, than there was in the South Pacific. But at the same time, it doesn't um, it doesn't change the factor because of the ocean currents and that gyro thing that we went through. Um, we didn't literally go by the garbage patch like over it. We went right by it, and even though it was like thousands of miles away, we still saw so much. It's a big and, island, and two thirds of it comes from here. Uh, <laughs> Most definite. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, one hour talk. Um, privately.